Hello, listeners. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by Anthony Rotuno, who you've heard on this podcast several times before, including the episodes about John Lennon a couple of years ago, the meditation episode last year, and also the episode we did about Monty Python and the Holy Grail, the film. Anthony is an English teacher like me. He's also a musician and a podcaster with no less than three podcasts to his name, one of which is called Glass Onion on John Lennon. The other, the other one is Film Gold, which is all about great films. And the third one is called Life and Life Only, in which Anthony discusses all manner of things, all as part of a search for inner and outer truth. So you know that on this podcast, I like to feature conversations with interesting guests to give you a chance to listen to natural British English as it's spoken. So for this episode, I thought I would ask Anthony about some of the different topics that I've heard him talking about before on Life and Life Only in order to have a deep and meaningful conversation about life, the universe and everything. Okay, so uh, hello, Anthony. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very scared now about the weightiness of all these topics. But yeah, let's do it. Can I ask a quick question? Because I don't do a lot of video podcasts. Should I look mm -hmm. at you or at the camera? Whatever you, whatever you prefer. Uh, okay. I tend to look at the person I'm speaking to. Yeah. But then sometimes the camera too. But yeah, often the person I'm speaking to, which is now normal, isn't it? When we watch videos of people having conversations online, they're always sort of like looking in totally mm. the wrong direction. Somehow mm. how our brains have got used to that. I see you've got your jacket on the door in the background, yeah, which has become your kind of visual trademark. Yeah, it means I can leave if it's going badly. <laughs> but this one, of course. No. Yeah. You've had comments about your jacket in the background, haven't have, you? Yeah, yes. Yeah, I, don't, I can't remember. Were they good or bad? I can't remember. I think it was just some one person who's like, comments. something like, make an effort with the background, mate. Why have yeah. you got a jacket hanging from the door? Well, a lot of people have like a bookcase full of books. I mean, I've actually yeah. got loads of boxes, but they're too low. I'm not gonna. Yeah, you need I... to get a you need to get a bookcase behind you. you can't you, you, no one's gonna um, like listen to you or respect what you have to say unless you have a, a bookcase behind yeah. you during in videos. The complete works of Chomsky or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, lots of uh, Beatles. I don't know if you noticed, but about ninety percent of the Beatles podcast community are rabid collectors. Mm. And if you look at when they do videos, they've got masses and masses. And I was on uh, Two Legs, you know, the Paul McCartney one. Yeah. And uh, I was saying, yeah, I'm not really as much of a collector. In fact, you could see my collection behind me. I was, uh, <laughs> it was just a bare wall, the same bare wall. But, uh, All right. So, Anthony, I've got 12 topics for you uh, for discussion. Okay. These are all things that you've talked about on your podcast. And this will probably end up being a marathon episode, but we will see. Are you ready? Yes. I'm not going to labour too much since we've got lots of weighty stuff. When we start talking about the universe, you know, it's a <laughs> start naming planets and things like that. No. Yeah, yes, well, I'm, probably I'm ready. Probably stick to Earth. I mean, you're not really, um, you're not into the astrophysics so much as just, you know, it's mainly Earth-based, let's say, all these mm. topics. So my first topic is, is actually life and life only. That's the first topic. So the question is, what is life and life only? And uh, what's it all about? The podcast, yeah. Well, yeah, and generally, <laughs> what's life um, all about? But yeah, the podcast, what's, what's, your, what's the podcast all about then? Right, in about, um, about 2013 is the first time I actually started thinking about doing podcasts. It didn't happen for another six years, although I put a few things online. So I always had in my mind to do some sort of Beatles-related podcast, which turned out to be Glass Onion on John Lennon. Um, but I had an idea for a general one. Um, because I have, I suppose, what is called an alternative view. I don't really think it's that alternative. Um, and I call it a search for inner and outer truth. And it's a podcast about life. And partly, to be honest, my motive was that as soon as I started the John Lennon one, I thought it had a shelf life of about six months. And after a year, I thought, well, I can keep it going for a few months. And now it's been four years, and I've already got the next three, four months already recorded, having these epic conversations and uh i kind of thought if i do a podcast about life there's no way i'll ever run out of topics so <laughs> it's partly that so yeah what it is the inner truth is um things like life coaching which we'll get onto, and it's i call it like getting yourself armor plated to take on the world so it's self-development psychology i studied psychology at college years ago um, and then the outer truth is how you receive information. So 
there is stuff about conspiracies again uh, i would like to talk about the the phrase which i guess we are mm -hmm. um and how how the world really works somewhat provably and somewhat theoretically you know what i mean mm -hmm. so i kind of found a way of getting those two strands because my own journey about 10 years ago no 15 years ago i started discovering let's say alternative information and i started getting into self-development so i've been on this 15 year sort of learning juggernaut and i found that there is a way of weaving those two things so if you look after yourself and if you try and see what life is really like and what's important you'll be in better condition physically mentally psychologically to tackle all the crap plus the good information that's coming in and trying to you know weave between the two and then occasionally it is a uh, i suppose a, an uh, impolite word would be a dumping ground for some episodes that i want to put in podcast form so for example i did one about uh, 10 rillington place which is a a true crime thing I'm absolutely obsessed with. I used to live in Labbert Grove and I, I've studied that to the hill. And I know a few other people I actually know a guy who wrote the only biography of John Christie. Who he, I don't know if your listeners will have heard of him, but he was a serial killer basically in the forties and fifties. So occasionally you get those outlier episodes, but I try and kind of weave it together. And then just recently I did an episode where I read a couple of my stories that you heard and said kind things about the other day. Mm hmm. And I, it's funny, almost during the conversation, I weaved them together. So it's almost like something that sometimes goes on, it's going on in my brain. <laughs> but that's it, really, inner and outer truth, a podcast about life. But within that, there's a load of stuff to talk about. And I, I typically read um, usually my essays and blog posts. And I found a nice sort of modus operandi. I've, I read a bit and then I interject and then I read a bit. And I always kind of know that I'll have stuff to say because, I mean, you've been in this game long enough. After a while, you get to, you know, you trust that you'll have stuff to say about whatever topic, you know? Yeah. That's you kind it. of plan a lot of stuff and then you extemporize. You you plan to, to improvise, as it were. Yeah, it's a bit like teaching, isn't it? You have a lesson plan and you can kind of, once you've planned a lot, you can then sort of dump it in the bin yeah. if you see fit uh, as as things arise in the classroom. Absolutely. Yeah. So my next topic in my list of things that you have talked about on your show is uh, cats. Mm. Yes, the animals, the pets, cats. Mm. You talked about cats in your recent episode. Yeah. What do you, what do you like about cats so much? Um, well, yeah, it's funny that a few years ago, I would have been one of the first people to, to um, quote the thing that someone said. I don't know if it's a quote or something someone mm -hmm. just put online. We've got the whole world in our pocket. A word of information in our pocket, you know, as I put on my podcast, we've got the Library of Alexandria in our pocket and we spend most of our time posting cat videos. <laughs> and you kind of get the point that perhaps we, you know, we like, we like trivial stuff because it's less effort than all this heavy stuff. But, um, basically, I'll make this a very short story. Um, by, by some means, my parents came upon this cat, um, and it basically, it more or less ran away from its home, which was quite near my parents' home. And around COVID time, I was staying with my parents. Uh, I'm not living at home, by the way. I'm 47. I moved out of <laughs> home when I was about 23. But just for a short time at COVID, I was dossing at whichever family member would take me because I was just coming back from Spain. Mm -hmm. And um, this cat just happened to be in a garden. And then um, it wasn't a rescue as such, but the family moved away and they already had nine cats. And I... Sort of so use my salesman tactics and <laughs> you didn't steal it though you didn't steal a cat no no i didn't steal a cat though <laughs> but <laughs> um no it's just uh i think the fascination is that that we always think of them as mysterious and everyone's like oh we don't know why cats do things but now with the internet there are loads and loads of really good videos and there's a couple of ted talks which mm. i could send you later on which i've used they're, they're only about five minutes each and they they sort of explain their behavior so they're a very interesting mixture of quite predictable, but then quite mysterious at the same time. And I just said on the last show that I think you can learn a lot from them because they're very good at protecting themselves and they're very good at self-care. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that we people in general are probably not very good at self-care. If you really analyze it, we probably spend all our time 
criticizing ourselves and not treating ourselves well. So there's a thing in the self-development genre of self-love. Again, we could make a joke about that, but let's not. Mm -hmm. We'll just think it instead. Yeah, okay. and it can get it can get a bit ridiculous, you know. Um, so, so, you know, I've seen posts where talk about self love. Look in yourself, look at yourself in the mirror, and say, "I love you" and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't do that kind of thing, but the idea of just just taking care of yourself and treating yourself like a friend. And the thing about cats is that people will say they're very selfish, and they probably are if you take that literally. You know, they, they're not particularly loyal. They're, they get attached to the house. Generally, dogs get attached to people. Cats get attached to houses. Mm. But within that, definitely with this cat, we've seen a real change because it was a real, literally a scaredy cat when it first arrived. It would just bolt at the first loud noise or anything. And then gradually I've seen it develop. So sort of bucking that thing that, that animals are always the same and that animals never change. And uh, I don't know. And obviously a lot of people will say, you know, stroking a cat and everything is very, very, meditative relaxing and they just have a sort of obviously a peaceful thing and my mum said something really interesting so my parents are in their 70s and they're long retired and uh my mum said having a cat it's like having a grand it's a female cat it's like having yeah. a granddaughter in the house but um a granddaughter who doesn't make any noise and doesn't <laughs> take any looking after <laughs> what could be better than that <laughs> yeah 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 um yeah, they they always say dogs are very loyal and stuff, and uh, but with cats, it's actually a mistake to think that they're our pets. In fact, we work for them is kind of the way it yeah. works, isn't it? That, uh, yeah. but you also talked about um, uh, the way that cats purr. Oh yeah, yeah. Was that in a TED talk? Mm. The purring thing. Mm. What what was that again? Um, yeah, it was a TED Ed talk, which is not a, someone giving a speech. It's just these animated with someone narrating it. Yeah, they went through various things about uh, their behavior, like why they like to they go like to go on window sills. It's because, in a nutshell, to a cat, I think I said a, ge a genteel garden in the suburbs is no, is no different to a jungle or a forest. They kind of almost think they're in the jungle, so they're always vigilant. But yeah, apparently, I don't think this is settled science by any means. But um, mm. in this video, they said something about the frequency of the purring um, can actually repair. Uh, what was it? Bone and muscle, bone and muscle tissue. Yeah, wow. That's what I said. And they actually said that, you know, obviously a lot of people like to have a cat on them, almost, you know, sleeping on them, yeah. on their lap or whatever. And apparently, again, I can't vouch for the science, but apparently you can heal your bone and, and tissue, bone and muscle tissue. Very interesting idea, though. Yeah, yeah. the frequency of the purring somehow mm. is therapeutic. Mm. But yeah, certainly stroking them and having them around is good isn't it it's good for our mental health and stuff like that definitely yeah there's someone someone once said uh two minutes of striking a cat's like six months of therapy you know they're exaggerating <laughs> but you get the idea yeah yeah yeah, yeah definitely yeah. okay i'm going to move mm. on to uh i think a completely unrelated topic except the fact that you know you've you've talked about it recently it's it's the, the third topic in my list and that is the titanic so a wild mm um tangent to deviation, something completely yeah. different a complete yeah. deviation here so the titanic anthony um you did what was it two episodes or a whole episode about the titanic so why mm. i mean it's a it's a whoa it's a very stupid story sorry it's a very stupid question but uh why the titanic why are you so interested in the titanic oh okay here we go uh yeah i did it too again i wrote this massive uh, long blog thing about 10 years ago when i was living in spain and um, with Life for Life Only, I've managed to use some of these. Like I was saying, I often read an essay I wrote years ago and interject. And I wrote this long thing on the Titanic. Yeah, it's very difficult to summarize, really. But um, when I, you know, often it's when the stuff you absorb when you're a kid. And it actually goes back to when I was at primary school. And I recently reconnected with an old friend and he heard it and he remembered that. One of our teachers played a, probably about 20 minute. A radio documentary about it and i remember even as i think we must be nine or ten maybe ten we we're in the last year of primary school and we were we were so sort of compelled by it we actually said oh can we listen to that again tomorrow mm. i think the teacher was surprised he's probably thinking i'm going to get these nine-year-olds interested in a hundred-year-old story of a boat sinking yeah um in a nutshell yeah i mean it's it's such an incredible multi-layered 
story about society because at that time, 1912, um, they were living in what's, I think Mark Twain called it the Gilded Age. And it was a time before, um, you know, rock stars, but the rock stars were people like J.P. Morgan and Guggenheim, if you've heard of him, or Macy's, uh, it's the Strausses who run Macy's in New York. Um, so they were the celebrities, and the Titanic was, at the time, just incredible luxury. Um, if you look now, it's actually tiny compared to those enormous cruise ships. There's a, mm. I've seen a picture comparing the two. Um, essentially, on the, on the ship, people will, of course, know the story from uh, 1990, the film in 1997. Yeah, They didn't mm. exist, obviously, but some of that wasn't too bad. It was strong on showing you the scale of it. It was strong on the special effects rather than the story. Yeah, and the moment when the boat sinks, I mean, that was, that's a pretty, pretty yeah. uh, exciting part of the film and uh, historically accurate as well, I understand. I mean, that bit was because, yeah, the, the boat split in two. But the, yeah. re the really interesting part about it, I mean, it, it's such a study of uh, society at that time and human nature because basically you had three classes on the ship and the upper class were at the top, the second class were at the, were at the middle, in the middle, and lower classes were at the bottom. Mm. And um, if you've seen, I'm sure you've seen the famous Frost Report sketch, and it's John Cleese, oh. Ronnie Barker, and Ronnie Corbett. Yeah. And the upper class guy's taller. They go down in size and they say, I am upper class. I look down on him and him. I'm middle class. I look up to him and down to him. Uh, down got, him. I get a I get a feeling of superiority over them. Yeah. Uh, that's the middle class guy who's like, I get a, a feeling really of... Darker. He's like, I get a feeling of inferiority from him because he has innate breeding. But I get a sense of superiority over him because he is lower class. And yeah. the lower class guy goes, I get a pain in the side of my neck because yeah. he's always having to look up at the others. Oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I look down on him because I am upper class. I look up to him because he is upper class. But I look down on him because he is lower class. <laughs> I am middle class. <laughs> I know my place. <laughs> I look up to them both. But I don't look up to him as much as I look up to him. Because <laughs> he has got innate breeding. I have got innate breeding, but I have not got any money. <laughs> so sometimes I look up to him. <laughs> I still look up to him, because although I have money, I am vulgar. <laughs> but I'm not as vulgar as him, so I still look down on him. I know my place. <laughs> I look up to them both. But while I am poor, I am industrious, honest and trustworthy. Had I the inclination, I could look down on them. <laughs> but I don't. We all know our place, but what do we get out of it? I get a feeling of superiority over them. I get a feeling of inferiority from him, but a feeling of superiority over him. <laughs> I get a pain in the back of my neck. Well, there's a whole thing about the classes in England as well, that the middle class protect the rich from the lower class, that they're, they're this sort of buffer almost. Anyway, mm. the, point, the point about it is that the position in the ship so perfectly mirrors society. But the other thing about it is that I'm sure you know that when it collided with the iceberg, there's a little bit of, um, there's lots of revisionism. I've got this massive 900-page book or something I read a few years ago that refuted some details of the official story. Um, but basically, there was a kind of a gash. It made this massive gash because what they did, they actually would have been better to hit it head on. But obviously, they're not. The guy is thinking, well, I'm not just going to let this happen. So what they did, they tried to turn. But because they didn't turn quick enough, it went all along the side. It made this massive gash in the side. Yeah. But the whole point of it is the higher you were on the ship, the less impact it would have. So the rich people were kind of going, oh, that was a bit uh, queer, meaning strange. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, what was that? Uh, they just felt this little jolt. And then the middle class people in the middle would have would felt a bit more. 
And then the, the guys working in the boiler room who are probably earning, I don't know, five pounds a year or something ridiculous like that. Mm. They, they were the ones sort of on the front, if you think of it in war, on the front line feeling the impact because there's gallons of gallons of water coming in every second or every minute. I don't know what the details are, but yeah. so it's a very interesting mirror in that if you take, uh, for example, the financial crisis of 2008 and even COVID as well, well, let's say the financial crisis is a better example. If you are rich in 2008, you're not going to be feeling that too much, right? Mm. But then obviously if you're poor, you know, you, your, your house is going to get foreclosed and there's all these stories. So it's, it's a perfect mirror of how the poor receive disasters directly. And then the higher you are up the social scale, the less you're impacted. Yeah. But in the end, then you get the absolute opposite of that, is that when they were on the lifeboats, and famously there weren't enough lifeboats because they, the regulations, they follow the regulations and even had four extra boats. But when they all got on the lifeboat, suddenly you've got a rich guy and a very poor guy, and they have to spend eight hours on a boat together, and they can't, escape each other so yeah. it's such a fascinating story of how the classes are different but in the end everything's equalized and just one final point the other thing is that it's it's so utterly surreal try try and imagine this for a second so it's obviously it's a it's a horror story it's horrific there's 22 people 2200 people 2200 people on board 700 get put off in the lifeboat so obviously 1500 odd die Try and yeah. imagine when that boat goes down, there's 1,500 people all screaming because they're all surely get, all going to be screaming in in freezing water where the book I had calculates you probably survive about 10 minutes if you're lucky. So these are all the – they're all in the water? Yes. You're screaming in the water, yeah. Yeah. At okay. At 2.30 in the morning when, you know, about three hours earlier, all they would have expected was just to go in a nice warm – you know, have a nice dinner and go to bed. It's utterly surreal. And then you've got all the story of the wireless operator. And I made a joke and I, I made it clear I wasn't making light of the disaster. But you've got all these ships and they've all got these very primitive radio sets, wireless sets, and they're all sending these messages. And you can see in the Cameron film and then in a film called A Night to Remember, which is a black and white film, which is quite faithful for its time. It's almost like the most primitive WhatsApp group. <laughs> And uh, I just, you know, I was trying to make make light of what was a very heavy story. So you've got all these messages, and sometimes they don't get the messages. Sometimes the messages get scrambled. And it's like having 100 people in a WhatsApp group. You know, you get all these messages. <laughs> um, but it's such an incredible story. And then uh, even even in, in death, the lower-class passengers were treated differently because apparently when uh, there was a rescue ship, not the one that picked up the passengers, one that went about a week later to try and pick up bodies. I think if they didn't have ID on them or if they didn't, I don't know, if they looked poor or whatever, they didn't identify them and give them a dignified burial. So, Wow. In a nutshell, it's a weird mixture of how the classes are different, but then everyone gets equalized in a disaster because a rich guy is not going to do any better in freezing water than a poor guy. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. So it's, it's really a sort of a little kind of case study about class in the in the in in um the last century yeah yeah it's really okay. interesting what do you think about it can i turn it back on you i don't know i mean mm. um i think the the story is really really compelling of course because of the that sense of um what's the what's the word for it where you're super confident uh but then it all comes crashing down complacency uh, yeah complacency but there's another one the sort of greek myth greek kind of um myth one um mm. the, the 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 word will come to me okay it was described as a greek tragedy in the book a night to remember because loads yeah. of things went wrong and yeah yeah also yeah. oh, the other thing about it is the hubris a uh, hubris yeah hubris the hubris, hubris of it yeah this you know the idea we've made this unsinkable boat and it's kind of like the pinnacle of modern engineering and stuff and mm. uh and then yeah there's there's a sort of romantic element to it as well with all these high society people in this kind of very sort of uh yeah very modern moment and then mm. uh yeah in the in the moonlight there's no moon it's just a completely black sky isn't it with stars it was a moonless night and the cloudless so. sky yeah there was another weird thing actually um yeah the, the lights stayed on apparently until about almost 30 seconds before the ship sank incredible timing they they managed to i don't know exactly how that works it's something to do with the boilers keeping the furnace 
going, they're keeping the lights mm-hmm. on, keeping the electricity on. And these guys, you know, they were working till almost the end and the wireless operator. So there's lots of heroic stories. But then there was a story that, I don't know, because it's, it's very easy to get on the backs of rich people because they are, the really rich people do, it's almost impossible for them to be really in touch with a common man, even if they mm. want to be. But there's some story that um, as it was going down, there was a, oh, I think he was called Cosmo Duff Gordon. You can imagine how rich he was. And Lady Gordon. There, wow. there was one, the other thing about it, that one of the boats only had 12 people out of 40. They were also, also underloaded. That's another story that I can't really go into now. Mm. And apparently, as it went down, this lady said to her assistant, oh, you'll never get your night dress back. And it, it, it almost seems a bit of a Hollywood thing because, you know, there's that sort of liberal um, underdog element that Hollywood loves putting in its stories, mm. that sort of idea, rich people bad, poor people good, which was in the Cameron film. Yeah. In one of the English books, actually. <laughs> Class conscious overkill, they called it. It's, is it. it's in like a headway or, or English file yeah. or something. It's, it's, I bet it's... Uh, live, everybody. The cutting edge. No, uh, New English file. New English file, classic, classic course book. Oh, I can't find it. Which, do you know, which level? Which level? That sounds like an upper intermediate or an advanced, advanced one. Advanced, yeah. Advanced, yeah. I thought so. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry. There's one, one final thing. Yeah. The other thing was that it was a very complacent age, as you said, full of hubris. Um, there is a story that the there's a, a line that Jack the Ripper, which is the famous Whitechapel, that was the end of the 19th century. Quote: gave birth to the 20th century because it woke the society up. Because before that, they probably never thought that anyone, serial killer, could exist. Titanic was two years before the First World War started. Um, It was also one year, in fact, before income tax and the Federal Reserve were introduced. Very interesting. on the more conspiratorial side. But it was was just on the cusp of this four-year sort of slaughter fest, which was the First World War. So it was a... Innocence was gradually going, and then obviously the 20th century was the death of innocence, really, if you think about it. Yeah, with everything that happened. So, and the, the the postmodern era, you know, like modernism gets to its gets to this point where it's like progress, adva- uh, making progress, and sort of technological mm-hmm. progress until it gets to a point where it's sort of like, yeah, these disasters happen, and the 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 the, the technology ends up being sort of. Um, catastrophic for humans with yeah. the machine guns in in world war one and and all the rest of it and that sort of yeah i guess led to that postmodern era which is a rejection of a lot of those um those ideas of progress and modernization mm. yeah 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 and that that sort of leads us into that sort of second half of the last century which was all about questioning what's what it's all uh, about and uh, um questioning all the narratives and stuff that we'd all as- ascribed to yeah, a friend of mine was, we were chatting. We talk a lot about, you know, the modern world and media and stuff. And he came up with a great line. He said, no one's quite sure when people are being truthful or ironic. Like everything is so topsy turvy now. Mm-hmm. That, you know, because the, the news to me, mainstream news, so resembles a, a kind of comedy show, like a bad comedy show. Because like the day to day. Exactly. Yeah. And you did a good, I watched one of your stand up videos that you, that's on YouTube, right? And you were yeah. talking about how um, the media talks like this. Um, today, 200 people died in, a, in an air crash in Nigeria. You know, it's, 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 that, it's God, up here. That, it's, you know, hmm. reports are coming in of an air crash in Nigeria. Yeah. Yeah. It's very strange. I'm talking, you know, like, uh, yeah, I don't know what the story would be. Reports have come in indicating that up to 1,500 people have been injured in the accident. Yeah. You know, experts are yet to make a statement. That sort of weird register, yeah. that, that this tone that they speak in. It's so mm-hmm. strange. And the other thing is that, again, I, I, I was listening to a podcast, I can't remember which one it was, and they were saying, if you really look at the news, it's like, dum, 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 dum. it's exciting music, colourful Lots of bright colours, blues and greens and reds. Maybe not reds, blues and greens. Mm. And uh, it's basically here's loads of here's loads of bad news. Here's loads of bad news. Here's loads of bad news. Here's a nice bit of news at the end about a cat being rescued from a tree. Join <laughs> us tomorrow for more shit news. Essentially, that is what they're saying. 
Join us yeah. tomorrow for up to the minute news. Here's loads of shit news, which is going to make you afraid of the world. You know, yeah. but don't worry, you know, sleep tight as Bill Hicks would say. Bill Hicks <laughs> is one of my heroes, as you know. Uh, mm. Mm. Very uh, uh, next topic, Anthony is traveling. Um, you've mm. traveled around a bit, haven't you? You've been around a bit. I've been around the block a few times. Yeah. Um, so tell me about your traveling experiences. Where have you been? Um, and what, what, what counts as your favorite or most memorable or perhaps even life changing, uh, traveling experience that you've had? Well, could I mention the one that I put in the last podcast? Cause I think that worked really well as a metaphor and I wasn't mm. really intending it. And again, it was a funny thing where I was reading it and then had a bit of a brainwave, if you like. Um, what have I been? Uh, well, I lived in Thailand and briefly lived in Laos as well. So Vietnam, Cambodia, been around yeah. that area. South America, I've been to a couple of places, Colombia, Ecuador. I went to India, and we could talk about that if you want. It's indescribable. It's the only way I can describe it or, not, or not describe it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a weird one, India, because obviously the British Empire is so implicated in India's quote unquote development and some people will say well they absolutely destroyed the country I did meet people in India you know I had a lot of conversations on trains because Indians educated Indians do tend to speak good English mm. um, and a lot of them like like uh, the British Empire and what the British did but you know in Spain they're supporters of Franco I mean I, I had a massive well they had an argument but they were good friends so it was a sort of a heated heated debate mm-hmm Mrs. Merton, let's have a heated debate. <laughs> it was one of those, no. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, India, it, it's, it's so weird. In Delhi, okay, which is the capital, I think officially the, the capital is, is it, is it called New Delhi or is it Delhi? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, it was New Delhi, wasn't it? Yes. Hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, anyway. Well, I can check. Yeah, if you, think of, if you think of Delhi, you can definitely make a – a distinction between new and old Delhi. And they, yeah. they had the Commonwealth Games, for example, in New Delhi. And if you go to the good areas of Delhi, they're these lovely, quite wide boulevards and it's pretty clean. And then you go to old Delhi and it's it's like something you can't even describe, you know, the amount of people. And I, I, I took a lot of photos and made some videos while I was there. And, you know, there's loads and loads of, of rubbish and, you know, there's, there's such a clear distinction. And Thailand, I was sort of thought of India as a more extreme version of Thailand because in Thailand you see old buildings next to plush hotels. You see that side by side. But Thailand is developing. Obviously, India is developing in one sense, but I would argue that really it's only the top portion of it that's developing while the rest is getting worse and worse. Sorry, By the way, I think that New Delhi is the name of the city and Delhi is the name of the area that the city is in. Uh, okay. But that's my quick uh, answer. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we talked about a class system in the UK. I mean, they've, mm. you know, they, they have, still have, or used to have that caste system in India, which obviously is, yeah. you know, it's probably going to um, uh, be reflected in the way that, uh, yeah, the, the sort of upper classes are, uh, the ones that are getting all the benefits of the development that are happening there, and it's yeah, it's yeah. a certain type of development where the underclass probably um, still live in complete poverty. Going and there's lower, probably like, even. Going yeah, lower, lower. lower. You'll probably, I mean, like uh, India is one of the developing economies, isn't it, as well? And also, the population is um, rapidly increasing. And um, is it going to? Is it? Is it already or going to be uh, more populous than China? I was just going to say, um, we're just reaching a point. I haven't checked recently. They're almost exactly the same. And they are almost not quite fifty percent of the world. Ah, uh, again, listeners can check that, can't they? But it's something like two billion each, and the population of the world's about eight billion. So we're just yeah. reaching an interesting point where they're about the same, and they're about fifty percent of the world. Probably not quite, but mm. I mean, imagine the whole country was locked down. Can you imagine that? Yeah, it's one just and a half incredible. billion, or however long, it, however many it is. Yeah, um, insane. But yeah, I had this travel story. Basically, um, I was traveling around the Mekong Delta. This before I lived in Thailand, I did the old backpacking. A bit later than my gap year, I think it was about 23, 24, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read uh, this story just 
before in my last podcast. And um, it was funny because I went backpacking. Uh, my first port of call was Thailand, but because I didn't, I didn't know anything about it, and someone had to- someone had actually told me, "Oh, when you get to when you get to Thailand, you get out of the airport, you'll probably be like really afraid." You know, you'll, you'll be going, "Oh my God, what is this? What have I walked into?" And of course, in reality, it's not really like that, particularly as the backpacking circuit. I don't know what it's like now, but twenty years ago, whenever that was, it's all you know. They direct you to certain places and everything. Um, but what was funny was that I think I think the amount you pack your suitcase is a quite a nice or, or backpack. Sorry, mm. it's quite a nice metaphor for how kind of insecure you are. Because if you <laughs> if you pack it to the hilt, you're like you're almost. It's almost like saying I, I'm not. I don't want anything spontaneous or weird to happen. I want to be like in control. And what was so funny was that um, I had this backpack and it was so packed with, you know, stuff like water purification tablets that I'd never need because I'd read this book. It was so funny. It was like, it, it, it was so hard on my back because I've always had a few back problems. But weirdly enough, it had a handle on the side. So I, I ended up carrying it, which is obviously like carrying it like a suitcase. And the whole point <laughs> is that I'm a backpacker. I'm not a tourist. I use a backpack, not a suitcase. And here I am carrying it like a suitcase. So I remember laughing at myself, you know. Because you were so concerned about having clean water to drink that you were willing to break your back carrying the water purification tablets around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, just in general, I think I'd read a bef- there, there was a book literally called Before You Go, and it was all right, but I think it was designed for people go to really remote areas. Yeah. Yeah, basically, to cut a very long story short, um, I lost my backpack. There was some, it was a kind of a mix-up between two boats of different companies, but they weren't marked. They may not, <laughs> to be honest, they may not even be real companies. I don't know. But yeah. um, I lost my backpack and it was going to be, it was going to take hours or I'd have to come back the next day. And I was actually on a tour. Um, so I suddenly thought, oh, whatever, I'll just let it go. And of you, had it, your, you had your passports and your money yeah. and stuff in a, in a, like Travel a bum bag kind of thing. Yeah. 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 And, so you, you, you had to like a, say farewell to your bag you'd probably never see it again after it went off on another on another boat yeah but the interesting thing the interesting thing is that the the sort of programmed reaction is to go oh no i've lost all my stuff but then someone that i was traveling with said uh said almost for a joke oh well you did you were complaining that you weren't traveling light enough and that's something i thought yes i'm traveling light look at this all i've got's this what a player i am you know what a great <laughs> traveler i am but then I, I suddenly thought, well, you know, because people would lend you, people will lend you stuff. If you ever get in an emergency, I mean, if you, even if you're in the street and you get in an emergency, the average passerby, if they're a decent person, will probably help you in, in some way. Yeah. And that's what you learn. So I learned that all I'd been doing up to them was just controlling everything. So like I say, the way, again, it's different. If you have a stressful job and you, you want to go away for two weeks in the sun, you know, I'm not saying for any in any stretch, that's a bad thing at all. But the idea of this was that we had months and we were traveling on a budget. But then I found that I was just controlling everything. And then yeah. suddenly I had this wonderful opportunity inadvertently to, to, to be more free and spontaneous. So I just thought it worked well. And, I, and that going with the spirit of life and life only, I had the idea of like traveling light in your mind, you know, being detached and not trying to control everything and not trying to predict. Mm. There's a, um, there's a, I can't remember. There's a term in life coaching. It's, it's about, it's, it's like clairvoyance or something, but in a bad way in that you're, we're always trying to predict the future and we're always preempting the future, mm. you know? Um, mm. So it was living in the moment. So you can travel light in your mind. Basically. Yeah. So it kind of like taught you to kind of let go a bit and uh, mm. to kind of not worry too much and not try to control everything that's happening. must've been yeah. quite liberating. Yeah, definitely. But it taught mm. me a lesson. I've never forgotten it. And then years and years later, when I started a blog, which is pre-podcast, I thought, well, I'll, oh, yeah, I'll write about that. And, you know, I stuck a couple of details in, but it was basically a true story. It's a good episode. Yeah, yeah I, I liked it. Yeah. Um, moving on mm. to teaching English, which you've mm. done in several places. Um, mm. So I, I wanted to talk to you about not so much like the learning English and teaching side of it, but more the experience as an English teacher of working with other people. So uh, having a group class or having a one-to-one lesson 
Mm. and having to deal with the group dynamics or the interpersonal dynamics. How have mm. you found that? How, uh, how have you managed to deal with that sense of interpersonal dynamics when you're teaching a, gr a group of people? Right. Well, since I'm a psychology guy, as you know, I mean, I, I in one way, it's a wonderful, same as um, I was manager of a William Hill, and I, and I hated, it's a betting shop for those who don't know, and I hated the job but as a, a sort of anthropological study. It was pretty interesting. Yeah. So, um, well, as you know, if you look at it in a, in a technical way, we've got all these icebreaker things to, you know, and let's say, say you get a group of 10 adults. I haven't really taught children since, well, one year I did. Mm -hmm. I was Never again. Defeated. Yeah, I was defeated. <laughs> Apart from the occasion, I had a teenage class in Italy, but they're all quite level, quite high level. I think that's important, isn't it? Say, mm. say you get a group of 10 adults who probably have never met each other. Um, it's very interesting that, you know, if you get them learning each other's names, then that's fine. You know, and there's practical stuff you do. But, but what I found amazing um, is that occasionally you get 10 people, they come in a room, and for some reason, as soon as they sit down, even before they've talked to each other, there's a warm atmosphere, and you just kind of know it's going to go well. And it just goes really well just from the first second. Of course, that lifts me and you and your teaching. You know, we need to be lifted by the students as well as the other way around, right? And then I've had other classes, and I just do exactly the same thing. But for some reason, they just either don't like each other or they're just not interested in each other, or maybe they're just really reserved. And you can always tell because those classes, they, they won't use each other's names, you know. When you get them doing group stuff, and I often get them – you know, you do pair work in threes or whatever. But I like doing stuff where one person has to ask a question across the room. Yeah. And you go around and or, or, either like, in a chain or something Running like that. dictations and things like that. Yeah, things like that. So they're just forced to interact. But then you'll find um, they'll often say, oh, oh, you, instead of using their name. Yeah, and it's yeah, just yeah. Like, This could be after three, four months. And it's just, it's bizarre. I can't quite explain it. So obviously it's a good challenge. So really the dynamics thing is interesting. And on the more humorous side, you must have had this. Have you ever had those sort of grammar fiends? Uh, I like people who like grammar because I actually love teaching grammar. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by grammar. Um, but have you ever had a student who sort of sits there not saying much and then out of the blue for just no reason, you'll go, can you explain past modals? What's the difference between may have, might have, and could have? And like, oh, where did that come from? Yeah. Have you ever had that? Like, a, oh just, yeah, definitely. Just shouting out random grammar questions. It's it's hilarious, really. So there's the, yeah, there's the people who who basically their entire experience of learning English has been sort of studying the the grammar in painstaking detail, yeah, yeah. and then they find themselves in a classroom, and so this is now there. They they have to somehow square, you know, put this. What is it? Put it to you, you know, they have to put these two things together of like, so I've learned my journey of learning English so far has been understanding the rules. And now here I am in this kind of communication situation. And so, yeah, they, they kind of like, well, uh, I better try and impose my knowledge of grammar here. And they will ask a question about grammar, which isn't a question. It's mm. just, it's a test, in fact. Yeah, I've yeah, been test, tested tested it. lots of times by yeah. students. They're like yeah. sending out these testing questions and you suddenly feel like, yeah, you're, you're being tested and you have to think on your feet. And also other yeah. questions like personal questions that they ask you as well to test you. Yeah. Like they'll, they'll just ask you if you're married and things mm. like that. Um, but uh, that, going back to that thing about having, like you're, you do exactly the same thing. One group, it just goes really well. The mm. things go really smoothly. And another group, you do the same thing and it's just a total disaster. Mm. I've also found the atmosphere in a, in a room to be completely different. So I've taught, like for example, um, in the same classroom, um, teaching one group where everything's going really well and you remember the room, you remember that group. The room seems so much smaller in your memory. Mm. When you remember like a really good group that you got on with, it feels like it was a small room. And then um, teaching to another group in the same room, but they don't get on with each other and there's a horrible atmosphere. It feels mm. like there's acres of space in the room. Mm. And also the air seems so much thicker and heavier. It's a really yeah. weird phenomenon. It's the same thing in stand-up as well. You get some rooms where you can just you just feel that there's something really good in the air and everyone's responding really well on the same wavelength. And then mm. you get the same another room and you do the same material and mm. it's just a tumbleweed. You know, so yeah, I don't understand that. I suppose it's, it's just the combination of 
of individuals. It's like, you know, you mix them up and you, you see what you get. Some of them are going to go together well and others just not. But yeah, that's a very weird thing. Have yeah. You taught- yeah. No, as I say, I'm, I'm very, I suppose I'm quite, I, I rely on inspiration to some extent. I mean, I can do a, a, quite a mechanical lesson if I have to. Mm-hmm. I, I think I transmit, I'm sure you're the same. I transmit enthusiasm when I'm enthusiastic. And I, I make a professional job of not transmitting boredom, but they probably, when I taught kids, I, I felt like they were picking up on absolutely everything, you know, the yeah. adults, maybe a bit less, but it's not that the classes necessarily go badly. It's just for some reason, they're not interested in each other, you know, mm. but I suppose then my professional, my more professional side would kick in and I'd do a more professional, more standard class. But yeah. with the other ones, I think what you're saying is absolutely right. The room seems smaller because everything's more intimate. And funnily enough, if you watch when people are more, well, we always think that open body language is being like this, but people actually lean in. If you notice, if you have lots of people around a table and it's quite intimate and everyone's sharing personal stuff in a nice way, everyone leans in. So it is literally mm. like there's a bit less space. It's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Mm. Um, what was I going to say? I was going to say something deeply profound. <laughs> oh, I was just going to, I was going to ask you actually if you've ever taught in in weird situations. Like have your classrooms always been fairly reasonable? Have your teaching environments always been sort of fairly good, fairly decent or have you ever taught in weird situations? Uh well right at the beginning um when I moved to Thailand I didn't have a job sorted but there are you know it's not that difficult to find a job over there. Mm. But the first couple of jobs I had were just just Ter- terrible really but it was just a, in at the deep end and um to make a generalization thai people are pretty non-confrontational so in a way it's the best breeding yeah. ground if you like but it was quite funny i um i went to this school originally i was going to be teaching in a high school which i never actually did and i did a trial class and <laughs> in, a, in a high school with like like oh, kids were they like teenagers yeah, they're about 12 or 13 but the thing about Again, generalizing Thai kids, they're not so much disruptive. They just look really bored if they're bored. And it's really hot all the time. And the worst schools don't have any air conditioning or fans. So everyone's sweating and they just get sleepier and sleepier. And um, and there was a Thai woman, probably maybe 40, 45 years old. Mm-hmm. And she was at the back of the class watching me. And I had to do about half an hour with 40 to 45, 12 or 13. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do? So I thought, I'll start with a joke. <laughs> the perfect audience. Of course, they're going to get it and react Yeah, of course, to they're going to get it. Yeah. So, I said, <laughs> so I said, right, I want all your names. And I started from, you know, as if I was going to get every 45 people's names. Yeah. And uh, the, the woman at the back just sort of, what? <laughs> and um, there was a teacher there, this is really interesting, who'd learned Thai. Because some people can learn Thai, Chinese, Japanese, those kind of languages that seem almost impossible when you hear them. Mm. He'd learned really good Thai, but he hadn't told anyone he was learning Thai because he wanted to know what the Thai people were saying about him. <laughs> and I won't divulge some of the stuff he said, but he said to me, can I swear? Or, yeah. Yeah. He said to me, this middle-aged woman said in Thai to her colleague, what the fuck is this idiot doing <laughs> in Thai? <laughs> he said that's a basic translation of what she said. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I was... I was ready to go home and it was just awful. And then I found a, what they call a language school or a language academy. And then suddenly it's one, one to ones and, um, you know, Adults. classes of six, seven. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, so yeah, I've probably had all kinds of stuff. Just people, people who appear, have you ever had students who they, they just don't appear for 20 classes? They, yeah. They've blown all their money and then they suddenly appear. <laughs> And they go, can you tell me what, what, what you've done since I've been away? And it's like... <laughs> It'd be easier to tell you what we haven't done. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Oh, can you, yeah, can you... Well, they, they come back as if nothing's happened. It's like ready to fit back in. And it's like, can, yeah, they say, can you give me photocopies of everything I've missed? <laughs> it's like, what? They're like, are you, are you kidding? That's about half yeah. a tree I would be... I, I need to photocopy for you. You do get some very flaky students. Yeah. I've had some pretty dodgy classrooms before. I taught in a in a room in London um, and I was writing on the whiteboard. It was a very dil- sort of dilapidated old building uh, and I was up in the cobwebby sort of rooms at the top of the building writing on a on a on this sketchy old whiteboard 
and the whiteboard just fell off the wall. It just popped oh, yeah. off the wall, clam, slam onto the floor at yeah. everyone's feet. Yeah. And um, so I just propped it up against the wall and it left a, 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 a sort of clean space because all the, the, the wallpaper around the whiteboard was filthy and disgusting. Mm. But when the whiteboard fell off, it left this perfect clean space that was actually cleaner than the whiteboard itself. Yeah. And so I just start, I could just continue the lesson and wrote on the wall mm. where the whiteboard had been and it was a kind of a gloss paint. So it actually worked better uh, just writing directly on the wall than it did writing on the whiteboard. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> just in the middle of the lesson, the whole thing just came down. Yeah, Everyone was amazing. shocked and I just moved it to one side and just carried on writing on the wall. Um, I yeah, taught brilliant. in a in a little cupboard once when the school was like uh, full and they put me into this little cupboard and we were all sitting around with our knees kind of touching each other, like about six of us in the room. And I had the... Um, the whiteboard leaning up against the door and ev every time anyone tried to come in the door would slam me on the back of the head um and yeah lots of other lots of other stupid things like that um yeah it's 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 good i wish i had recordings of all of the stupid and funny moments that have come up mm. in uh, english lessons over the years because there have been a lot like including people saying really weird and stupid things and just odd moments and funny characters. I wish I'd recorded it all. Yeah. Um, I think we'll move on though, Anthony, um, as we kind of like, you know, move from thing to thing here. Life coaching is the next thing. So this mm. is another thing that you do. So life coaching, what is it? Uh, and how do you do it? Hmm. Yeah, right. So life coaching is a fairly modern invention, if you like. It's probably about 30 years ago, I think, in America. Um, how do I explain it? It's a little bit, it's slightly undefined. The way I look at it, um, if you had severe stress or, well, severe anxiety or severe depression, you would need to go to a therapist, uh, a licensed therapist. Um, in a sense, a life coach, if you had, let's say, if you were quite stressed or you had some level of anxiety, but not chronic anxiety, or you were, you didn't seem to have a direction or whatever it was. You're not very good at managing your life, perhaps. Then you might go to a life coach. And um, I did write a thing about this ages ago. I think it was one of the Life and Life Only episodes, I think. Yeah. And I, I tried to define it. It's almost a bit like it's a bit like a friend. There's a placebo element to it because if you're talking to someone who you feel has knowledge and knows what they're talking about, it's like the placebo thing with a doctor. When someone goes to a doctor they like, they they often magically get better. Mm. You know, even if you mm -hmm. gave them, even if you gave them a pill that didn't mean anything and said, "Oh, I believe strongly in this," they go, "Oh, yes, doctor." You know, so there's a placebo element to it. But it's, um, yeah, I suppose it's uh, it could be seen as a as a, a a first step towards therapy, or as a separate thing. But it's basically people who are struggling with motivation. And it's a conversation, you know. I um, think I noted on that, that podcast you heard recently, it's interesting with my life, I've always been struggling with identity. And now I find myself, so I do English classes, life coaching, I have a meetup group, I do podcasts and I write. And in a funny way, often an idea from a meetup group will end up in my English class. An idea from an English class will end up in my whatever podcast. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've realized in the end, it's all about conversation. So life coaching is essentially an ongoing dialogue. And, you know, you have to know what you're doing. Obviously, you have to have some knowledge and there's practical steps. But you you suss out generally, some people are looking for very practical steps. So maybe they're in America, in America, they have these really cheesy slogans, like, I'm great, but I want to be even better. It's that kind of thing. So some people, it's successful people. And they want to be even more successful. You know, they want to mm -hmm. learn like loads of really good practical motion, motivational tips. And I could do that. You know, it's rather like an English, you know, as we're saying with an English class, someone say, I want to improve my grammar or my vocab. I don't want any sort of funny stories or, or interesting conversation. I just mm -hmm. want that, that, and that. Mm -hmm. And I can do mm -hmm. that. But like with the English teaching, I much prefer having an interesting dialogue gets quite intimate and I share stuff about my life and it's just a really nice dialogue and I name checked um, a guy called Daryl and he just wrote to me actually because he heard the 
you heard the podcast. Yeah, it's a dialogue and, and what you get out of it is that you, you can make improvements. But the thing with life coaching is that the person already has the answers and you never use, you'll, you'll appreciate this as an English teacher, you never use modals like should and could. You say, perhaps you could do this. Have mm. you considered doing this? But it doesn't have a set thing. Essentially, it's if you think of it as someone paying money for a service, whether that's English or anything, I try and think of it as in the same envelope as my English teaching in a way, although mm. they're obviously going to be native speakers. Although, funnily enough, I was coaching a Spanish lady last year, and there was some English English element to it as well. So it's... Um, yeah. In, in a nutshell, it's a dialogue helping people improve their life. So there is a therapeutic aspect to it. Do you ever find that the two sort of switch over, that you just mentioned life coaching, which kind of included bits of English training? Do you ever find that as an English teacher, you end up becoming a sort of a life coach for your students as well? Absolutely. What, what are some of the most common areas that you have to deal with in that regard? Is this motivation just, and stuff? Yeah. Confidence, just, confidence a lot, issues. A lot of it is stress. I'm sure you've found this. You, you often teach business, um, stressed out business men or women, and they get a double whammy. They get to get everything off their chest while speaking English. So it works <laughs> great for them. And you do feel like, you know, you are a listener sometimes. But like I was saying, yeah, I mean, those, those two overlap. The meetup overlaps. I think when they... I start talking about stuff and I often impart stuff I've learned from, you know, self-development books or podcasts, or whatever it is. And it just gradually develops really, but it's just, you know, they might, they might be stressed. They might be lacking direction. It could be anything really. Mm, mm, um, okay. But I, I prefer the emotional side to the practical side, but there's a bit of both obviously. Yeah, definitely. I, I often hear teachers talking about how they also have to be therapists mm. for their students because there's often, Often um, uh, learning English, it's not just about, you know, learning the language and using it, but l like uh, the mentality and dealing with confidence issues mm. um, is a huge part of it. And you sometimes get the impression that people are blocked in terms of pronunciation because they're all, it's all messed up with their identity and how they feel about themselves and, and things like that. French people, for example, you said you have a lot of French students. Mm. French people mostly generally are quite tra well sort of traumatized or maybe i should just say they they've all gone ha gone through bad experiences at school and now they've got these sort of major confidence issues around speaking english because they remember the way that they were treated at school and like lessons at school are all not very much fun they're all about translating grammar and lots of written work and they get like very severely criticized and sort of almost punished by their teachers for making mistakes and they get judged between each other too so it sort of creates the environment in which speaking english for them is like really a stressful problematic thing and a lot, a lot of french people have got very good english as well they don't admit it or they they're not willing to admit it to themselves they might have a strong accent but a lot of the, especially the vocab, actually translates really well for them. Mm. So my wife, for example, she's French and she'll be talking to my parents and she'll say something and they'll be like, wow, your English is good. And she'll say to me, actually, to be honest, it's just the same in French. I just translated it. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. And often like translating from French to English results in this very impressive English. It um, sounds more elegant, doesn't it? Because they're taking the Latin words so often, the same in obviously Spanish, Italian as well. If you yeah. translate it directly, it comes out as really fancy because it's the Latin word, the longer word. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah that's right. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, yeah, French people often have confidence issues, which is like a whole other set of things. You, you can't really solve those problems with grammar rules or mm. phonemes and stuff like that. So there's, there is always that other element, Definitely. the human element. Do you teach, uh, what kind of levels do you teach? Or do you teach all levels? I teach all levels. Uh, this year, for some reason, my boss has given me B1 classes, so I'm teaching B1, good solid B1. It's and amazing, last year, right last year it was B2. Uh, so those, those, those uh, are great. I love B2. I think it's my favourite level. B1 is great too. Yeah, yeah. C2 is also fantastic. But then you're dealing with like a situation where, for for a lot of the students at C1, that's it. They're not going to get better than that and getting through to c2 is a is a bit of a mystery and it's very hard to get to c2 in english because that means 
uh, being flawless, but also having a certain control and certain level of naturalness in the in the language. And it's hard to really acquire that unless you uh, have sort of grown up in the country or something like that. But having said that, I've met lots of students who do through sheer sort of bloody mindedness and by focusing and studying uh, they actually do break through to, to C2 so that's an amazing thing what about you what what kind of groups do you teach at the moment well at the moment I'm, I'm literally only doing uh, remote so it'd be one to one like this one to one with adults yeah. but I found myself a niche yeah B, B1 upwards as, as I'm the same just for my listeners, maybe you don't know what we're talking about. So B1 is right in the middle, isn't it? Solid, intermediate, fairly good. B2 is upper intermediate, C1 is advanced, C2 is proficiency. Mm. That's very good. But then I do have um, – I am teaching a lady uh, who is A2, let's call it, elementary. And I, yeah. and I, I was really dreading it, I'll be honest. Um, but it's a different journey. It's quite nice. And it feels almost a little bit more quote unquote real teaching because you're yeah. taking someone from the ground up almost. Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying that obviously high levels is not real teaching. It is. It's just a different thing. It's a softer kind of thing, isn't it? At high level, there's a lot more sort of, um, yeah, fluff that goes along with it in the sense that you end up getting into topics and getting into pragmatics and stuff. Whereas at uh, an A2 level, it's about conjugating all the verbs in in you know third person and negatives and then dealing with different tenses and the basics absolute basics yeah it's always a frightening prospect when you get uh, an elementary class you think oh my god mm -hmm. because there's no sort of breathing space you know in a, in an advanced class you can always kind of have a discussion for 15 minutes if mm -hmm. you need to uh, but with an elementary group there's really no way you can there's go no flow. there's no flow really is there well there could be there could be but yeah Having said that, you can get to a state where you there is some flow, but you have to be quite contrived about it. Mm. So it's you end up doing things like playing very limited and controlled kinds of games and things, yeah. or having role play conversations where basically they're just moving around the room, having exactly the same interaction with the same with different yeah. people. But it, you know, like you know, just what what you know, what do you do? I'm a teacher. What are you doing at the moment? I'm learning French you know and just those sorts of things Absolutely. it's possible to actually it's possible to create role plays where you encourage the students to use it, certain bits of language oh, like I've come up, oh sorry, mm, sorry. No, i was gonna on. say i've come up with some stupid things before like mm -hmm. it came up with one which was a, a village idiot right so there's a there's a th this this town somewhere in england and everyone in the town is an idiot but there's one especially stupid person and they're, they're all unemployed in this town as well and this guy is going around and he meets people and he basically says, what are you doing? And then and they say what they're doing and he goes, all right, okay, cool. How long have you been doing that then? Mm. And, and they're like, so it's like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm throwing rocks into this lake. Oh, right, cool. How long have you been doing that? Oh, I don't know. I've been doing it about half an hour. How many rocks have you thrown in? And it's purely to perfect, yeah. present, perfect, simple and continuous. How long have you been doing it? How many have you done? Mm. And so that can go on forever. And it's like really funny as well if you get them to do really stupid things. Like, oh, what are you doing? I'm, 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 I'm thinking about Pamela Anderson. All oh, right, right. How long have you been? You know, how long have you been thinking about her? <laughs> yeah, you can, you can come up with some pretty stupid examples. So it can be pretty funny, but you have to think about it a bit more. Yeah, carefully. I find it hard at, at first. Um, it's just one very quick story was when we were talking about English teaching. In Thailand, um, I've had high-level students. There are some very high-level students. Generally, people who've lived abroad, and we were talking about Thai society, and we made the same point that when you go outside your own country and then come back, you get a much better idea of the, the limitations of your own culture. Yeah, And to me, as a Westerner, Thai culture seemed more extreme and it was more collectivist. This guy, he'd learned this word collectivist and he was really happy with it. And we had a long discussion about individual versus collective. And that, that in schools, you were saying about the other students laughing at them. In Thailand, they have a brutal sense of humor. It's just yeah. a different sense of humor and it involves laughing. So if someone makes a mistake in a, in a class of 40, almost the whole rest of the class will just point and laugh and it, can imagine but but then i'd have students who would if they were you know from quite moneyed families they'd be able to go abroad to us 
Australia, they went often because it's mm. nearer America or, or Britain or Ireland as well. And uh, often a couple of people came back. They were young people, 18, 19. They came back from three months in Australia or the state, and they'd want to talk about Thai culture. And you just would not recognize the person who'd left. I mean, one guy came back with an Australian accent, which is hilarious. Really authentic as well. Oh, yeah. G'day, guys. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just like back that. from Australia. A bit like that, yeah. It's sort of more of a relaxed, so that kind of relaxed Australian. But it was so funny. But that's one of the best things about about the the job. Sometimes, obviously, seeing the journey, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, especially with like sort of younger university age uh, students mm. who kind of learn and then you know, like yeah, I had that experience in Japan, meeting sort of younger students and teaching them for a, you know, a few months, and then they off off they go to have some experience. They come back and they're like, they've totally grown up and everything. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, teaching's amazing. One of the things I love about doing the podcast as well is that the thing about teaching is that you you would teach students for a, maybe a few weeks or a few months, and then it's like, bye, see you, that's it, and then they go away, and you never ever see them ever again. You never get a sense of what happened next. So there was always that sense that, like, with teaching, you're just constantly saying goodbye to these people. Yeah. But with the podcast, what I like about it is that there's this sense of, like, a develop, like a long-term thing mm -hmm. and um, that this linear sort of long-term thing. And also some people have listened to episodes for a long time mm -hmm. and they tell you about their progress and their journey and you get the you know you get really get the sense of how it's how it works long term rather than just over a few weeks you know the impact that yeah. you have you have over a few weeks versus the impact you have over months and months and years and years and stuff it's really good i find that the podcast people have told me that like listening to the podcast long term has really helped so that's very it's very satisfying oh, of course as a teacher yeah. yeah very much so yes um mm. anthony so we are halfway through the topics <laughs> Right, we knew uh, it was going to happen, though, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, we did. So, uh, and I don't have time to finish all of this off because to talk about the other ones, we'd need to, you know, have a bit more time because there's some good topics in there. So, would you be uh, available slash willing to kind of conclude this conversation at a later date? Yeah, yeah. Do, I do a bit more. Or have you got time now? Or? I don't really have time because I've got to go and pick up my daughter, which is sort of was a sort of unexpected thing. So, I think it's probably best if we. Uh, we pause here and then we can continue and deal with the other six topics that I've got lined up for you <laughs> uh, nice. later on. I should think we, we quick, can probably should do, we do a quick plug for the other thing we're doing. In a few days? Sure. So next week we're going to do a mm. recording for one of your shows, film gold. Mm. Um, we're going to talk about a film, which um, I've been sort of mildly obsessed with mm. uh, since I saw it last year. I think uh, my, my brother was always going on about this film. He'd always say, oh, have you seen sorcerer yet? Mm. And I've been like, oh, I haven't got around to seeing it. And I finally saw it and it kind of blew me away. So, and I was, uh, I was keen to talk to, so I just need to talk to someone about yeah, it. I've got to talk to someone, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Sorcerer mm, next week on your be. podcast. So yeah. people will be able to listen to that at some point. I don't know when that will be out, but maybe by the time this is published, which will probably be in the summer. Um, maybe it will be. Available. Oh, really? You're publishing this in the summer? Oh, yeah, I expect right. so. Ah, did you, you thought I would publish it straight away? Did oh, you? I had no idea. No, I yeah, know. I've got a huge pipeline queue of episodes oh, that I'm, I'm just pumping out episodes because my my wife is pregnant with our second child. Ah, congratulations! Thank you. So, uh, sh so the the child is due at the beginning of July. So I am trying to make as many episodes as I can so that oh. I can get like about two months without having to record anything. So this will be, a, a, by the time this comes out, I'll probably be, be sitting on the end of a bed somewhere, desperately trying to stop an infant from crying or wow. something like that. Mm. Okay. Exciting. Yeah. Okay. Well, Anthony, thank you so much for talking to us all about these sort of various things. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess people can listen to the actual podcast if they want to, if they want to hear more of this kind of stuff. What's the best place to, to, to get your stuff? How do people find your work? Uh, it's basically everywhere. Life and Life Only is on Podbean, if you want to go to the, the actual website. And uh, there's a YouTube version. which I, I use a different picture for each episode, so it looks it's quite eye-catching when you look at it. And that was episode 37, the last one. But mm. we'll be talking about other ones, won't we? But yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I, I read a couple of stories. So it was that travel story, and then there was a weird one called Pure Heaven. I don't know. 
Yeah, just yeah, yeah. Next time, what you thought about that? Because it was yeah. weird. It was, it was during a period of insomnia, um, and I woke up and almost wrote this story, not quite automatically, but it was the closest I've ever come to automatic writing, as they call it. Because then I, I went, I managed to get back to sleep, and when I woke up, I, I sort of had a vague memory. I, what was I doing at four o'clock this morning? And I, so it was, it was quite. It's called pure heaven, and it was quite pure in a sense that I'd never really done that before. So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting story. As I was listening to it, I was like thinking, "Wow, this is pretty inventive stuff." And mm. I, I was kind of like half listening at the beginning uh, as you told the story at the start of your story. Mm. You describe so basically, this is a story listener about uh, how Anthony ends up going to heaven, and he describes what it's like in heaven and stuff. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> but you also talk about how you get killed and how you end up going there. And, and y in the story, you get stabbed as part like there's a fight outside a pub and you get stabbed. And I was listening to this and thinking, oh, shit, did he really get stabbed? Uh, so for a moment, I thought it was real. But then I realized, ah, no, this is this is his story that he came up with. Yeah. Uh, and then you end up in heaven. Very interesting stuff. Mm. Um, so life and life only listeners you can get it wherever you get your podcasts you'll yeah. find links in the description um, or in on the page for this episode on my website uh, but um, right well I, I must go now because I've got to yeah. make sure that my child isn't left sort of uh, defenseless hope just on her own fight, offending for herself uh, in the middle of Paris I need to go and get her uh, but uh, it's been great to talk to you Anthony and right. uh should we yeah, stay on the forward. line for a minute or something? Yeah, we'll stay on the line for a minute okay. after I stop recording. Okay. But uh, yeah, I look forward to doing part two. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Cheers.